I just want to introduce myself. I'm Aubrey Turner, Office of Sponsor Programs. Uh, we have back here Julie Voorhees, Office of Sponsor Programs, who greeted you on the way in. Um, you know, we organized this. Uh, the highlight really is not Julie and I, it's Mitch. <laughs> Croat. Yeah, no, really. And uh, Mitch has taken his time to um, basically today he's going to tell his story of how he um, not only applied for the NSF career uh, grant, but won it. And so he is currently our only career awardee on campus. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a big deal. Um, the, I think the, you know, the, there has been uh, you know, a change on campus. There's a lot of new faculty. And so it's an exciting time for the university. Um, it's an opportunity to maybe see if there are ways to support all the new faculty, you know, in terms of if it's an NSF career application or are there are other things. And so that was part of what was you know, in our minds as we reached out to Mitch and said, you know, you think you could just tell your story, provide your tips, tell us uh, you know, what worked what would you not do again? What would you do? So that, that's what Mitch is here to do. It's very informal. Um, and we'll have hopefully plenty of time for your questions afterwards. Um, so uh, the only hitch is we're going to give you this, this uh, <laughs> orange beautiful box. orange box with a microphone <laughs> to ask so, just so we get the audio. So um, I'm going to spend just like maybe two or three minutes going through um, a few highlights of this handout that you all have. Um, this is heavily plagiarized from the NSF career announcement itself. It's also from the uh, NSF, uh, there's a webinar that you can find uh, that NSF program officers uh, put on the, there's a link from the mechanism. So no big surprises here, but I just want to go through this to sort of refresh everyone on what the career mechanism is. So it's all about early development of academic careers. So the, you know, the, the, the big tip there is you need to pretty much be an assistant professor on a tenure track. Um, it's big focus is integration of not just research, but research and integration uh, and education. So, um, you know, if you're really strong on one or the other, you know, you, you kind of need to be able to pull all of that together. And Mitch can talk about the balance that he struck between those two. Um, you know, that uh, that's I think that's an important consideration. Um, all of the NSF directorates participate in this. So, if you're in education. You're in the you know, social and behavioral side, or if you're in you know the more of the natural sciences, every NSF directorate supports uh, this. Um, so, to me, that's kind of a sign of how important this is for NSF. Um, let's see. So you get three total attempts to apply. So you need to choose carefully. You need to be strategic. Mitch can talk some about that strategy that he employed. I would say you know talk to people in your discipline, uh, talk to program officers, get their feel. Um, each person's going to have a you know unique situation, and you want to think through uh, whether you're ready to take that first attempt and when to do that. Um, let's see. So these are single PI projects, so no co-PIs. This is really you know it's about developing your career, as I mentioned right at the outset. Um, it has a research and teaching component. Um, you know uh, you need to so you need to demonstrate some commitment to both of those. The career it varies some across NSF. Um, there are what I like to call cultural differences across NSF. Um, so some of the advice you're going to hear from Mitch may be specific to his directorate uh, that he applied to. So take, you know, take all of it in, but also realize you know, you're going to need to probably try to get some insight into whatever, whichever directorate you're applying to. Anyone else? No, we have at least one other chemist, so you, you can just like take what he says, just, <laughs> just file it and just follow it. You have the template. Um, uh, the, let's see, so the career varies across NSF. The award sizes vary some, uh, we'll get into that in a second. The scope of research versus the educational activities. There are, you know, again, there are cultural differences in terms of how that's implemented. Um, so you just need to talk to people about that. Um, the merit review varies across NSF. Uh, the funding rate varies a lot, you know, so I have, I found from 8% to 30%, I mean, that's, that's pretty drastic. But, most are somewhere in between, like 10, 20 percent. Um, let's see. You uh, a couple other things. Um, you can get course buyout during the academic year. Um, some programs may want to fund projects really close to the minimum size uh, of of award. So uh, you'll need to kind of scope that out for your directorate. Um, and so your due dates every. 
third week of July, pretty much for, from now until this mechanism, you know, gets reannounced. So this year it's going to be July 17th, 18th, and 19th of, well, I say this year, like this coming year of 2019. Um, and that just depends on your directorate, um, and it varies a little bit by year. Um, uh, it's a five-year award typically. Um, usually the minimum is 400000 all right, across those five years. Um, a few directorates have a, a little bit higher cap of 500000 I've provided the links here to the, the solicitation, the FAQs, the program page, all that is there. Um, there's some great information on all those. I really like the FAQs personally. So. So that's it. That's your intro. That's kind of your, you know, laying a little bit of a foundation here. I'm going to pass it on to Mitch, uh, let him say a little bit. Um, oh, and one more thing I want to say. Um, uh, if, you know, if y'all have feedback uh, at, at the end, we, we want your feedback. And I guess we want to make sure we, when we come back at the end um, to this, to your questions, um, be thinking throughout this, what would be helpful to you later on? So one of the things I asked Mitch is, you know, what would be helpful? I want you all to really think about that. That's your assignment for now. Um, in terms of, you know, would there be a follow-up activity? Would you like to get back together with folks that are maybe applying for, uh, you know, for this? Maybe, you know, we could get a social and behavioral group or we could get more of a natural sciences group and um, have a little bit of accountability in a writing group or, or what? You know, what is it? Talk with a program officer. So that's your assignment. Mitch, I'll turn it over to you. All right. So, so. Uh I received a very kind introduction, realizing, you know, so I, so I did win this uh, career award, and I'm very proud of that and very happy with that, but uh, it's not like everything I touch turns to gold. That is for sure not the case. Uh, I didn't win the career on my first shot. I did win it on my second shot, which I was uh, very pleased with, um, but I've written a lot of proposals that haven't got funded. I've written a whole lot more proposals than, than, than what have been funded. So, um, you know, with the career award, it's obviously for uh, new assistant professors, um, or I should say, any assistant professor. Um, and I remember when I when I started as assistant professor, someone gave the advice that like, oh, you got to have thick skin. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm throwing the BS flag on that. You, you you don't have thick skin. You you acquire thick skin through you know calluses and blisters and burns and stuff. So uh, you're going to write proposals. They're not going to get funded. That's okay. That's that's how you get it. And actually, one of the the big bits of advice that I have. Um, that when I when I talked with Aubrey, I was I was floored by how few career proposal submissions the university has. Um, submit it. You 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 have a zero percent chance of winning one if you don't submit, uh, and you have a slightly higher than zero percentage of winning if you do submit, uh, infinitely larger. Uh, but you get feedback from these, right? So um, again, I can't speak for for all uh, directors at the NSF, but. Um, you know, so, so both with, with my career proposal, but I've also reviewed uh, for the NSF as well for a career proposal. And right from the get-go, the, the, the chair of our, of our uh, review panel said, just so you know, we're going to discuss all of these. That's not typically true when you apply to the NSF or the NIH that they're going to discuss all of the proposals. But they said, we're going to discuss all of them because we know that all these people are new assistant professors that need feedback. And they're going to use the feedback they get from this proposal to either help with a future proposal to the NSF, or maybe it's to the ACSPRF, or whatever mechanism that they're looking for to get funded. So, um, so I sort of did that the first time. So, so I started in 2010, um, and, I, and I started off quickly. I was, I was really uh, surprised by, by how quickly my research was progressing. Um, we, we had a publication in my first year, which is pretty rare in chemistry, so I thought, all right, I thought that was going to be my, my trump card to get that career funded right away. So I, I originally hadn't planned on submitting a, a, uh, a career proposal that in the summer after my first year, uh, but because I had that first publication, I thought, all right, let's use this to your, your advantage. So I submitted a, a career proposal, and it wasn't funded. And that's okay, because then I got a lot of feedback on that proposal that I then used to improve a proposal for a different one to the American Chemical Society that then did get funded, right? So then, so then I didn't apply for the, <clears throat> for the career the second, the, my summer after my second year because then I had that, that ACSPRF that I, that I had. So then I built up more research and then I applied the next year uh, for the PRF, so, or, so for the career. So one major bit of advice I have is, is apply, go for it. You're not going to win if you don't go for it. So, so go for it. 
you're going to get good feedback. That feedback could be important for a grant. It could also be good feedback for maybe you're working on a publication or you're working on the study. These are going to be your experts in your area that are giving you, you know, honest feedback on this idea. So uh, by proposing, you're then soliciting them for what they think of your ideas and everything like that. Um, I've met people uh, at conferences that, that you know, uh, helped me to, to modify that. And it was, it was pretty clear that like, they had reviewed my proposal. <laughs> they were very, quite familiar. And they were able to give really good advice that, that was echoed in the review. So, so submit it. Uh, as Aubrey pointed out, you get three shots. Uh, so you need to be kind of timely in terms of when you submit. Like I said, I, I chose to submit after my first year. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't typically recommend that unless you have like some really solid data that, that uh, give, gives you the thought that maybe you're going to win it, right? But even though I submit in my first year, it was probably too early, but I got that feedback, right? So that was beneficial. I've known people that were like, I'm going to wait until my third, fourth, and fifth year uh, to, to submit. Um, if things are going good, go, go early, like I said, because that can help later on. Um, so again, I can't speak to all the directorates, but for mine, uh, so the NSF is different from the, the NIH and, and, and other mechanisms. Every, everyone's different, right? Uh, one of the things that drove me crazy with the NSF is they don't tell you if they're going to fund you or not until you get the reviews, which means you don't get the reviews until they tell you whether or not they're funded, right? So uh, as was pointed out, you submit in July. Um, the first time that I got rejected, uh, I got rejected in like January or something like that, which is actually pretty typical for the NSF. You only get one submission window per year, right? So when he says July, it's not like July and October, and February, it's July. That's it, right? Uh, so submit in July, found out in January, it was, it was rejected, got the reviews, you know, and, and, and moved on. Uh, the second time that I submit, uh, you know, January came and went. February came and went, March came and went, and I'm it's just like, ah, is it laws? You know, I'm logging in every day, a couple times, and uh, and 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 looking, and you know, so it was in the system. It just had, so then I contact the program officer, didn't get a response. Wait a couple of days, contact him again, and said, you know, yeah, you know, we'll we'll let you know. We can't give you any information. I didn't find out until like it was it was like mid to end of May until I found out that it was funded, right? So I was clearly in that gray area, right? So if you're if you're clearly getting funded, you get contact in January. If you're clearly not getting funded, you get contact in January, and depending on the on the directorate. Uh, but mine was in the deep in the gray area, and eventually, you know, I I was very happy. But it was really hard for me because I knew I only had one more shot, and I was going up for tenure the next year. So I I knew I only had that year that I was going to submit, and so I wanted. The revision. So realize you don't always get timely reviews. You get the reviews, but they, they might be a while down the line. Um, all right, so what are some other things I was going to say? Uh, all right, so with the proposal, as is pointed out, a, a big difference for the career proposal from at least other proposals that, that, are, in, that are in my area that I've done um, is there's a uh, two kind of components to the career proposal. There's the the kind of wet lab research kind of component. Uh, and then there's the kind of education uh, integration of your research and teaching kind of thing. Um, and it, at least in my area, both of those components are highly valued. When I was reviewing for the NSF career proposals, um, the, there was one proposal that was phenomenal. It was it, This person had published a bunch in top journals. It was, was clearly just off to a, a, a rocket of a start. And the teaching component of the, of the career proposal was clearly played second fiddle and was just kind of thrown in there at the end. It was, it was very clear that that wasn't, I shouldn't say that it was clear that it was passionate. It wasn't clear that, that he was also passionate about that. And it didn't get funded. And the, the, the program officer that was, that was uh, part of the review said, you know, this, this person has another couple tries that they're going to be able to have. I'll make sure to give this person the phone calls that they know that they need to, you know, really incorporate both. And then the next year he got funded, you know, so that that's good. But um, make sure that you that you weigh both of them. Now the major benefit that that has is uh, for universities like this, where you know the the teacher scholar model is really uh, valued and 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 presented as what we should be striving for, not just the research model, but this 
teacher scholar, both of them combined. Um, there was so so I don't know which of I guess I didn't I didn't you know look back to see who got funded from the the group that we that we reviewed, but um, there was one that was at a at a university that was much smaller than than we are. That was if it wasn't our top, it was our second in terms of of ranking kind of thing. Um, because they had a they had a really good research proposal and their their kind of teaching component was really it was fantastic you know so um, don't think oh you know I'm I'm competing with the Harvards and the Caltechs and the MITs there's no way that I can do it for one don't ever think that don't ever think that right we all have to do that that's just the world we live in we we can go toe to toe with them but then with this one you know because we do have a lot of resources we've got the UTLC we have all sorts of resources on campus that we can use to our our strengths. Um, now, with the teaching component, I would say one of the biggest mistakes I made the first go around with my career proposal was uh, the NSF has kind of examples uh, of, of areas and things you can do for, for the, the broader impacts and the teaching component, uh, specifically for the career. I think it might even be part of the, the FAQs. Um, I took that as a laundry list of, of things that I need to do or a bunch of boxes I needed to check off, right? So then for that component, I said, all right, I'm going to help increase uh, uh, underrepresented minorities in the department by doing this. And I'm going to uh, you know, establish new curriculum for a class by doing this. And I'm going to do this. And I had, you know, in that section, uh, I had like seven or eight things that I was going to do. Now, the research proposal, I know better about how to write a research proposal. So that one I had like, you know, two or three objectives or two or three aims kind of thing. I didn't have seven or eight because I knew that that's foolish, right? But then for the educational part, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have like seven or eight because they listed seven or eight. The more you do, the better it looks. And it reviewed horribly, right? Because it was like, well, are you going to do something good or are you just going to do a bunch of things poorly, right? <laughs> so consider that, that second component just like the research component. Have like one or two, maximum three things that you're going to do and you're going to do and, and get into it, right? Uh, if if, the, if the, the restrictions are the same, if I remember right, I think it's like 15 pages in total. So I had like 10 pages for research, five pages for the, for the kind of teaching uh, component to it. Um, and get creative, but don't get overly uh, ambitious, right? So uh, when I reviewed for them, there was one that, that had some really good ideas, and then it was brought up that like, man, this is going to take, you know, 10 hours a week the entire time that they're there that's in addition to the other you know, responsibilities as assistant professor and, and, it, and it reviewed really poorly because it was, there was no statement that they will not have as much teaching because they're going to be doing this. So, you, so make sure that it's realistic, make sure it's within um, kind of your job responsibilities. And if it's not, then you need to make sure to have some sort of indication why this is going to be feasible kind of thing. Just like with the research component, that you wouldn't want to say that you need all this instrumentation and the university doesn't have that, right? You know, so you want to make sure that it's, that it's reasonable. Um, I'm trying to hit the highlights and then, and then we'll get some Q&As here. So um, another thing with the, with the NSF, both in terms of writing and reviewing, is that, that every part of the proposal matters. Uh, so in chemistry and biochemistry, uh, I, you know, we run a lot of reactions. We do generate data, but data we don't manage like big data in in my lab. So there's part of the part of the proposal is a data management plan, and I thought, all right, this is for people that have a lot of you know database and acquiring a lot of information and stuff. So I first time I submit, I, I didn't put a lot of effort into it, um, and I would absolutely say that my proposal wasn't you know rejected because of that, but it wasn't accepted of that either. Every every document that you generate, every the bio sketch, you know, every component of it, the postdoc mentoring plan. Uh, you get one page for that postdoc mentoring plan. Make it a good page. Make it something that they look at and they're like, wow, this person really is, is trying hard. This person really is uh, passionate about this proposal. These ideas are fantastic. Let's, let's fund this proposal. You want to, every document that you submit to them should be, should be crafted so that it's like, all right, someone's going to champion this grant. Because uh, the way that the review panels go nowadays, it's not so much hey, which of these is good? It's you need someone on that panel that's going to look at your proposal and pick it up and say, this is the one I'm going to champion. I'm going to get this proposal funded no matter what kind of thing. And you need, you need to give them you know, the weaponry to, to do that. Um, 
And part, part of the reason why I know that every document matters is when I, so I, I went to a NSF uh, grant writing panel uh, when I was probably a second year assistant professor, something like that. And it was, it was really useful. So I, I would recommend um, look up, there's, there's national and there's regional uh, NSF grant writing uh, conferences that you can go to. That's really helpful. I was hoping to, to get some face time with the, the program officer in, in, in my area. That didn't happen. He wasn't there. But, um, but I you know, got some face time with his boss and you know, got some definite insights. That was where I got the insight of you know, don't propose eight things for your, for your teaching goals. Um, so um, consider all that. Um, a component that, that I imagine varies a lot between directorates is um, how much the, the kind of you know, teaching goals and the research goals, how much integration there is. Um, in our area, uh, if there's good integration, it reviews well. But if there's not good integration, it's just considered OK. And it's, it doesn't review poorly kind of thing. Um, I imagine in other areas that, that it might be uh, much more beneficial to have it integrated. It always looks better if you can integrate it. If you can you know, take what you're doing in your research uh, environment and, and connect that up with a, with a, a, a course, uh, that, would, that would review well. Um, OK, so, so another thing that was incredibly important uh, for getting the proposal funded, along with other proposals, is get a funded proposal. Look to see who has been funded. Who do you know that, that has an NSF career? Um, and if your area is anything like mine, you send it an e them an email, and you know, within half an hour, you then get a response saying, hey, here's your proposal. At least that's, that's what, how, how the responses were with me. Um, everyone that I asked for if I could get a copy of their proposal, um, and I always made some comment like, "Don't worry, I won't. I won't be disseminating this. You know, I, I will uh, keep a copy just for myself." Every single person right away said, "No problem, here it is." And every time anyone has asked me uh, for proposal, and this goes for any of you guys. I mean, my proposal is probably there's probably one person that can read some of my proposal, and, and many people that can read the the, the teaching component. You could look at um, by all means, shoot me an email. And, uh, and I have no qualms uh, sending that out to anyone, um, especially now. It's, it's almost done. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, get, get a funded proposal. And this, that goes for any, any proposal. Um, when I was uh, writing an R15, the first thing I did is I asked uh, Najin and, and Kim, hey, could you give me a copy of your funded uh, R15? Um, if, you, if you know the person well that got funded from the NSF career, uh, and they're in your area, unlike me, for most of you. Um, you know, ask if you could have a phone call to get some tips from them. Um, ask if they review for the career and, and you know what what advice they have from that. So, um, I feel like one of the major benefits of academia is we want to help each other out. We're here to educate the world, right? And that includes one another, faculty members, right? Um, I've never, at least personally, had a case where I felt like. They were concerned that me getting funded would make them not funded or their friend not funded, and therefore they didn't help me. I never had a case like that. Everyone wants to help each other out. So, all right. With that, I'm going to open it up to any questions or comments or requests. Who wants to keep oh. up? Yeah, I have this. Um, thanks. Sarah Heredia. I'm Science Ed. Um, I just want to say, uh, Dr. Carlone also got a career grant funded in yes. education. Yes. Um, so any social behavioral sciences folks, we do have another person on campus that has an ed one. So just FYI. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I was wondering about timing, do they include your postdoc in the timing or is it just So years? Uh, my understanding is you have to be pre-tenure. Okay. Uh, you, you have to be, I should say, untenured, um, what, October after you apply? Mm -hmm. Right, so you right. can't be about to get tenure, you know, because mm -hmm. for example, here when you get tenure, it's going to be August first. It's not like you can apply right before you know you're going to get it, um, and you have to be an assistant professor. I, I don't think that there's, there's a there's no time. clock. Like no, nope. exactly. Not clock. like okay. you know the they NIH is. Clock, yeah. Early stage, no, okay. No clock. Okay, so it's just the three times, and you can't get tenure the year after you would apply. Correct. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like the okay. month after. The month. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, and that's a great point. We've had uh, Heidi, Heidi Carlone had an uh, NSF career a few years back, and we've had, I think, a few others on yep. campus. Mitch is, is the only active, so active. yeah, sorry okay. to, no, yeah, great. sorry that's that wasn't. Great. There are other examples on campus. There are, yep. yeah, yeah, so maybe we can ask, ask mm -hmm. Heidi for, um, if 
Good share, yeah. Who else has a question? Hi, uh, Swami Mohanty from Computer Science. Um, could you give us some examples of how you integrated uh, the education components to your research? Yeah, so um, so for the, the career proposal that got funded, kind of my, my educational components, if I can remember them all. So okay, so uh, I should, because there wasn't seven or eight this time around. Uh, so one of them was uh, a discussion panel that I formulated in our department. Um, it was centered on careers after UNCG. Uh, so we had, so that, that was to help um, both you know, educate the students in our department, but also um, assist with underrepresented minorities because they often, you know, if you're a first generation college student, a lot of uh, URMs um, don't have as much mentorship and therefore, because our department wasn't as big, I wanted them to be more educated of their opportunities. So we had um, different discussion panels. For example, I had one on uh, academic opportunities, but I specifically asked someone to come from a community college, from a private university, from a, a large public university, a smaller public university, right? So they saw the different options. I had, you know, non-academic jobs. So I had a biotech person, a pharmaceutical company, someone who worked at the EPA, uh, someone that worked at a research institute. Um, we had a uh, women in science uh, discussion panel. We had a uh, racial minorities in science. So, um, so this brings up a good point. So just like with the research component, the more preliminary data or publications in that area that you have, the stronger it is. Likewise with the educational components. If you're just proposing stuff, that's, that's good. But if you're proposing stuff and saying, and I've already done this with it, right? So when I proposed the, the panels, it was really a continuation of the panels that I've already done. And here's the topics that I've done so far. So then that kind of reviewed well saying, hey, you know, this person isn't going to have to spend the time to, to establish this. They've established it, and it's, it's very good. So that was one of the components. Um, another component was, so I teach organic chemistry, and uh, learning the names of the functional groups is difficult in organic chemistry. Uh, so I, I, I worked with Bruce Kirchhoff in biology uh, to establish a, a computer program to uh, kind of flash up the, the pictures, and then, and then the image went away, and then they had to put in the, the name of the functional group. So it was, um, I would say not really related to my research, it was just with organic chemistry in the, in the classroom. Um, and then uh, my research group, especially at that time, uh, was, was uh, very diverse. I think it was uh, in terms of chemistry and computer science. There, there's an underrepresentation of women in, the, in these areas. Um, so then I was able to say, uh, women are underrepresented in chemistry, and in my research group, two-thirds of my group members are, are women. Uh, I had a, a number of uh, African-American chemists that are extremely underrepresented in, in chemistry. Um, I had a PhD student that had just had triplets, and I was able to, and a, and a postdoc, and someone else, another student that, that had children. I say I give flexible work hours to accommodate uh, situations like this because it, it helps kind of level the playing field and stuff like that. So. Um, I gave some kind of statistics of, of my group to show that I'm, I'm actively recruiting. You have to be careful with that. Sometimes if you just say, hey, I'm going to recruit uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of underrepresented minorities, the response automatically is going to be like, okay, that's good, so how are you going to do it, right? Um, so you need, you need some, something in there, or like it, just like with the research, if you have the data to back up that you're being successful with it, then that kind of review as well. Yes? Hi, I'm Prashanti from Computer Science. Um, so from what you described about your education components, it, it seems like it was more or less an independent part and not necessarily tied to the outcomes of your research part. Would you say that is more or less typical, or would you say that the education needs to focus around the products that your research comes up with? I would say for my field, it's pretty typical that they're independent. Um, or that there's not strong ties. Um, I, can't, I can't speak to, to other fields. Um, the fact that they have in there that they want integration tells me that it's probably more common that there is more integration, um, but in, in my field, it's, it's usually not that common. When I was, when I was reviewing, again, I was reviewing for, for chemistry, um, it, was, it was much more common that they were kind of independent. They weren't, they weren't viewed that harshly. 
Um, some other examples of ones that I, I did see when I, when I kind of going back to the previous question um, that I've seen in terms of educational components. Um, there was one person that uh, had some instrumentation that their university had uh, really well, and they were able to um, have it be online and, and usable uh, remotely and was able to go to local schools to show, you know, so then they kind of presented, and when I say local schools, I mean like, you know, elementary schools and everything, or I guess high schools, um, and talk to them about, you know, instrumentation, but then they're able to kind of log on remotely and be like, all right, so, you know, this is what the, the kind of data we're looking for, let's take a look at it, and able to kind of run experiments, you know, live. Um, the more that you can actually get more kind of community outreach outside the university, the, the better. Those, those reviewed well. Um, sometimes uh, people would volunteer, so for example, this last weekend we had Tech Savvy that was here on campus um, that, that Laura Tu and, and AAUW organizes. Um, there was a number of career proposals where someone kind of plugged into a program like that that was already going and multiple reviewers for the, on, the, on the review panel pointed out that like even though they're not the one that's coming up with the idea, they're coming up maybe with the idea for the program that's a part of it. And that, and that actually reviewed well because, again, they didn't have to spend that, that time and investment of, of establishing the tech savvy and, and you know, how do we recruit people, how are we going to fundraise for this. All, all that is already taken care of by someone else, and they're just plugging into that and adding value to it kind of thing. So things like the tech savvy um, are, are good things to, to consider. So I, just in response to this um, question about the integration of research and, and teaching activities, so I just recently um, reviewed for the education directorate, and in that directorate, it was it was really important to have the education and the research integrated. So as a, just a quick example, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, one, one of the proposals, the research proposal was around um, studying the, the effects of um, summer research, ex like summer authentic research experiences for high schoolers and college students, um, and and so then, th so that was the research focus. The the uh, teaching activity focus was building out a component of a summer research program focused on uh, education and and social science research. So so there were clear connections, and those reviewed much uh, more favorably than. There were a few proposals that, that we saw that there like superficially there was a connection, but they weren't really integrated and they kind of took a hit for that in the review process. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Jasmine, I'm from um, psychology. And as a, as a postdoc, I had an experience applying for both NSF and NIH um, postdoctoral awards, and since I do interdisciplinary work, I got comments from each that mine was kind of a better fit for the other, right? Mm. So from NSF that my work is a little too clinical, and mm. NIH that my work is maybe a little more basic and was a better fit for NSF. I was wondering kind of the extent to which that kind of comes up in these career awards, and if there's, you know, kind of strategies to work on that. Um, so I haven't had that come up with a career. I've got a colleague that um, so Nick Oberlees, and, and he kind of, uh, you know, sometimes his proposals, especially with the NSF, are kind of, is it more biology, or is it more chemistry? Um, and he's had just regular NSFs where, you know, he'll have a phone call with the program officer, and, and okay, this seems like the right avenue, and then it gets reviewed, and it's clear, like, they felt like it should be somewhere else. Um, I don't have a great solution for it. I, you know, so, so um, I would, I would expect that if something's getting reviewed in that panel, and if someone said, ah, oh, this seems like it's better fit for over here, um, I, would, I would hope that for that career panel discussion that the program officer would step in and say, you know, that's not the panel's decision on whether it fits this or that. They're just there to, to evaluate the science and the, and, the, and the proposal, not where, what director should fund it and, and stuff like that. So I, I, think, I think that's more of the, you know, programmatic, you know, program level stuff. But, um, but it is tough. If you can make it fit a little better in one, I imagine it would review better for one. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a better answer than that. Thank you. Esther Lurkies from the School of Health and Human Sciences. 
Um, I think the NSF NIH thing often goes back to the broader impacts, and those who've had a history of funding from NIH often have to talk about the translational implications of their work, and I understand that NSF primarily wants to fund basic research, mm -hmm. with the exception of the Education and Human Resource, Resources branch. Um, how do you talk about the broader impact of the research piece, particularly if you're in a social science? Oh, I'm not going to be the good one to answer that one. Uh, do you have advice? You went to the NSF conference. Did you hear any tips on that answer? Or? Um, <laughs> I did not hear tips. I heard a lot of um, dissenting views from within the NSF staff. Um, one of the speakers actually said, if you've had NIH funding, then probably NSF is not for you. When I probed others, they said, oh, I'm horrified that someone said that. That's not true at all. Um, but maybe now that I know that Heidi has had one of these, we could look. But hers might have been the EHR branch, yeah. which again is the one that says the application is okay. But I don't know, Troy, if you have any experience where you've seen, th but this is a barrier for social scientists. So if you believe that there are implications of your work, do you just not talk about them? I, and and I think, everything I think, else we do trains us that you're supposed to talk about them. I, I think that's probably a little bit true in terms of if you have, so for example, in, in, in chemistry, so I, you know, I, I write proposals to the NIH and I write them to the NSF. Um, there, there's a couple things I do to try to minimize my career proposal or other NSF proposals being looked at as, oh, it's just a rewritten NIH proposal, right? Because um, the NSF, their, their budget is minuscule compared to the NIH. Now, the NIH has other stuff going on, but the NSF, at least in my opinion and talking with people, feels like, all right, if anything's medicinal at all or, or you know, health-related, okay, we're gonna, NIH can take care of that. They've got the, the lion's share of funding. Um, so, like, when I write my, my, my NSF proposals, uh, I don't use specific aims. I use objectives. Just so that the wording is different, right? You try to use, you know, different wording of stuff. When I talk about the broader impacts, I don't talk about this will, you know, develop new leads for medicines. I talk about this will provide new ways of making molecules, you know, and, and talk about a broad area that would be impacted by that as opposed to anything health-related or at least if I talk about health-related, I'll also say or new materials or new, you know, photodiode, you know, so stuff like that. So. Um, I, I think you, you do want to be careful about if, if, it's, if it's either written with, you know, kind of the, the more typical NIH style uh, in terms of formatting, in terms of word choice. Um, and I think the, the same is true for the NIH, right? So if someone writes a, an NIH proposal or, or other areas and talks about the broader impacts of this research or da 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 they're going to be like, oh, this is just an NSF that they revamped, right? So um, I, th I think you have to be careful about that. I don't have a better answer, so. Uh, Ayalo from biology. Um, because this is a single PI proposal, if we have to use a costly equipment, and we don't also have expertise to use this equipment. Is it okay to propose that we will get trained on this equipment and we'll do it by ourselves, or would we will outsource the piece of this uh, experiment? Um, I think probably a phone call with the program officer would be the best idea in this case. But but so my thoughts. So you can't have a co-PI, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have a collaborator on a on a grant. So for example. Um, I did have collaborators on my uh, NSF career proposal, but not co-PI. And, and if they're a collaborator, you need to really specify you know, what you're collaborating with them, and you don't want that to be a major part of you know, one of the aims or something like that, because then it'll look like, all right, what, what they don't want to do is they don't want some tenured person to be leading the project, and they're just trying to get more funds by you know, writing a proposal and having some assistant professor submitted as the PI kind of thing. So um, it, I, think it's, I think it's completely OK to have collaborators on the, on the NSF career proposal. You just want to make sure that their role is, is somewhat limited. Um, and actually, at the, at the NSF grant writing conference that I attended, 
again, this must have been 2012, something like that. Um, they were actually talking about considering allowing co-PIs on the career. Obviously, they haven't yet. Um, but they realize, you know, at the conference, I can't tell me you know, how many times I heard interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary. The, the, the NSF loves that, right? They, they want to have this kind of multiplier effect uh, with their funds, right? They want it to go even further, and, and therefore they, they want multiple disciplines and everything. Um, and, and during one of the Q&As, someone brought up, they're like, you want all these multidisciplinary things, but yet you can't have more than one PI on, on your kind of gold standard for the assistant professor kind of thing. Um, and, and they said that they were, they were looking at that. Like I said, they, they, they haven't changed it yet. Um, who knows, maybe five years from now it will change. But yeah, so you can have a collaborator, just make sure you don't write them in too much. You, know, you wouldn't want them to be you know, uh, a third of your budget to be you know, using that instrument for them to use it. Now, if you're going to get trained and use it, well, then that's OK for a third of your budget to be used for that. Yeah, and I think, Mitch, I think your comments are exactly what, uh, what they say in the NSF, uh, the, uh, the webinar. It, they actually use, I think, the word you can have limited uh, support for collaborators. So, yep. What other questions do you all have? So I've got one. Did did you have um, much? Uh, did did you have, did you have to decide much between whether you were going to go for the career versus a standard award? And mm. I think the biggest difference I think is the educational piece and, and that integration. Did you? How how did you balance that out and weigh it out? Yeah. So that's that's a that's a very good comment. So um, kind of related to what Esther was talking about. So for example, I don't know how many people apply to the NIH here, but for the NIH, it's almost like if you get an NIH proposal, your chances of getting another NIH are actually, I would say, even higher. And then you get another one of you in a higher, and it's a little bit of a you know, rich get richer. And the NSF is very different from that, uh, at least in my area. And I think this is, I, I wouldn't say universally true, but universally considered is they want to spread out their, their portfolio of who they're funding kind of thing. So um, at least in my area, it's very well known that if you get an NSF uh, regular NSF award that you shouldn't apply for the career award at least for the funding period that would overlap because they don't want to ha you to have two uh, NSF grants. If you have an NSF grant, the NSF wants you to focus on that NSF grant. You should have everything on that, not having multiple NSF grants. It's, it, 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 it's extremely rare for someone to have multiple NSF grants. They might be a collaborator on a different NSF, but they won't be PI on two NSFs. Um, so I, I actually knew someone that got a regular NSF award uh, and then applied for a career in the program so officer called him and said, you know, I mean, we can get this thing reviewed, but, you know, it's not going to get funded. Do you, want, do you really want to use one of your, you know, three attempts because it's, we're not going to fund it because you already have an NSF. And he's like, oh, I didn't know. He's like, well, why didn't you apply for the career? He's like, because I didn't know, you know. So, uh, so, so I, I, I was a little bit careful about that. Um, now, so the regular NSF uh, is due later than the career. Um, so when I applied for the career, later on in that cycle, uh, in that year, I did apply for a regular NSF um, because my funds were running out. And I was, you know, it was going dry. I needed some other, some other funds. So um, I ended up not getting the regular NSF and got that review pretty quickly. And then later on, the, got the career. So um, you do have to plan that out. So the, so the regular NSF is due, or the career is due in July, and the regular NSF was due last week. I can tell you because I submit one. So. Um, yeah. It all takes time, too. So, so if you're thinking about doing an NSF career for, let's say, the summer, or maybe the summer after, start writing. It, it, it takes constant constant writing and revising and writing and revising and, and whittling away at the idea, um, which um, we all know, but it's not on our schedule of things to do. It's not like the 9 o'clock lecture you have to give. It's not like uh, the seminar at 1 o'clock. It's very nebulous. So, so schedule in time to work on your career. Set, set goals and deadlines that I'm going to have uh, you know, the AIMS page written or the AIMS worked out or the objectives <laughs> uh, by a certain date. And, and I'm going to, you know, 
have maybe eight ideas for educational components by this time, and then I'm going to whittle that down to my top five by this date. I'm going to have my top three by this date. You know, set, set goals, otherwise it'll all get you know, delayed until, until the deadline comes, which I make that comment, and yet I was submitting them the 11th hour for my last two grants, as Valeria can attest to. <laughs> but did you work on your career for, what, six, nine, 12 months out? Like, yeah, the so first so, time you really sat down and said, I'm working on the career, about how far out would you say it is? Uh, I, I, would say, I would say I was working on the research component of my career proposal um, at least a, a year out, because when I started, I started writing that thing um, and then submitting that first summer. The educational component was probably about three months out um, that I started, but I only started working on it heavily, you know, about two or three weeks out, and that was and that was that was too late. It was it was tough, and again, I didn't I didn't think the data management plan, you know, counted. Which um, I, I would say again, no one in my field is going to win a career award from their data management plan, but they could severely hinder their ability if it's you know. I saw one that they just said, this is not applicable to my research. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. No, because you won't get funded. <laughs> you know, so. I've seen a few of those. It's sad. Yeah. So we have just a few more minutes. Maybe could we take a couple of minutes and, and poll the group? Uh, remember that assignment I gave you at the beginning to think about what would be helpful? Uh, I, I know you are super busy. Uh, we talked about teaching and seminars and all of that, and then there's this nebulous grant stuff that has to happen in the in-between spaces, and I get that. Is it helpful to do things? You know, I think Esther asked some great questions about the balance uh, of um, outcomes, broader impacts, <coughs> and uh, the social behavioral side of these proposals. Is it helpful to get a group together that's around, framed around social behavioral, you know, the psychology people, the human development people, the education people, could that be a group? And you meet regularly, you have someone to hold you kind of accountable. I don't know, you know, versus the natural sciences, you know, we could, we could do something like this if it's helpful. I mean, what, what do you think? Would you, if, if we had that when you were working on yours, would you wanna, would you say, yeah, meet once a month, meet bi-weekly? I mean, or yeah, no. my, my opinion on the matter would be that it would probably be helpful. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, always, it's always up to you. Um, but uh, I, I think it would be helpful because then you'd have something on your schedule. Um, for example, um, you know, you could meet and say, all right, you know, by the next time we meet next month, uh, we're going to have the you know, objectives written out. And then when we meet, we can kind of pitch them off each other a little bit because um, just it's, it's one thing to like write and rewrite and write and rewrite, and it's another to like talk to someone about it. Um, so you could imagine, you know, having lunch together or something like that, and and having different people uh, pitch their their objectives off each other and, and get feedback, but also just the act of talking about it sometimes helps. So I I would recommend it. Okay. So there's a thought. What else? What would y'all you know? What would y'all say? Yeah. Can you pull to just see? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Shaquana Freeman Green. Um, can we just poll to see who's, I don't even know who else. I'm assuming like we're education over here, but I don't even know There's like mix, yeah. how um, many of us, like if we're forming groups, like you don't want large groups and then you get together and it's not very productive. But I'm just wondering if we already know like our specific um, director that we're applying to, who else is in that area with us? Yes, I, have, I think I have everybody's name and department, but let's do just a show of hands. Who believes they would fit under the social, behavioral, educational side? So you can see we've got a pretty good cohort here. Uh, I'm a natural scientist, so I'm a discipline. Yeah, okay. So, okay. <laughs> education, human resources. I'm kind of lumping all of that, and maybe that's too broad. It, it may be that. Go ahead, Esther. But I'm actually wondering about that group starting together initially, Aubrey, because I think that in itself is a great question. Because some of the research topics, and I'm just thinking of the faculty I know in HHS, 
the questions that they have, I think, span EHR and social behavioral sciences. And even having a discussion about how do you know which is the better one to pursue could be probably very useful. Right. I was thinking, yeah, maybe maybe some of that, and maybe some of the conversations that you know, if, if we could get a group together and maybe have a conversation with a program officer as a group to sort through some of that to get two program officers, maybe you know, do a, a WebEx or something. So how about the natural sciences? I know this will be a, okay, so a good group. And all very, doing very different things. Um, Which is good, I think. So yeah, you think it's good? Okay, yeah, good. I, I, I think you, you need them in the areas so they can speak the same language, but you don't want it so close because what I struggle oftentimes is, is you know, you want your, your AIMS page to be able to be read by the program officer who might not be in your direct field and, and be able to think, oh, this is really good. So you, you do need a little bit of a speaking to a broader audience, you know. So the research component needs to be, you know, deep in the trenches, but, um, you know, the, the educational component should be, you know, well read by anyone, so. Okay. so we'll see, we'll see if, is there anything else that y'all would like? You know, what, what can, what can we do, or what, what would you like to do? Yeah, Somya. So if we have like a first draft ready, and uh, I mean, if there is a way through which your side could maybe proofread or see if the objectives are being met uh, and give us some prior feedback before submission, would that? Just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or, so do, you, do you still have that mechanism yeah. off? So where they would send it off to people to actually review it? So you know, is that still going on? So there's, within the college, I know that there is a, uh, thing uh, Stan Faith couldn't be here, but he uh, actually he wanted me to put in a word for the I think it's called proposal preparation something P two or P three, uh, but they have a actually funding available to pay for you to send your proposal out for editing and proofreading and expert reviewers. So that's available. Is that right? It's separate. So the P three is for research costs associated with like pilot data. And oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, all right. I'm sorry, yeah. So, so that's available. I, I know HHS has some available funds for similar. And then if you get down to the end and you just want people to look for language and, and you know, kind of non-disciplinary expertise, Julie and I can provide that. We read a lot of proposals. Um, uh, it's all about, you know, the time. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, so you have layers of support there. And then, you know, if we could get groups together here, I think that would be another source of uh, kind of forming up ideas. So it could be, you could you could imagine a lot of support. So I, I can, anyway, yep. yeah. Well, and, and one of the things that, so when Aubrey met with me to, to talk about doing this, he said, you know, at, at the big universities that have, you know, multiple, you know, careers, you know, in departments, let alone within the university, they have they have these groups that meet, you know, and, and, and you know, so this group would be just the chemistry people, you know, talking about it kind of thing. We don't have that, so what, what Aubrey's trying to do is, is set this up, but um, yeah. I think by having that group would, would also help. But um, definitely for outside the field, take advantage of it. So I've never been able to take advantage of that because my proposals are never <laughs> to the stage <laughs> where we have time to send it out, uh, which is, which is uh, shame on me. Um, but if you've, got, yeah, if, if you've got it ready um, and you think it's, it's good, you know, the, the college has funds to, to send it out to get reviewed. Okay, so I guess we're at noon. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, we'll send out a follow-up kind of poll about to see who's you know who's really interested in working towards this. Uh, real quick, just show of hands. Who believes they would probably be interested in like submitting for the July 2019 deadline? All right. It, who thinks they'd be interested in like submitting for 2020 or beyond? Okay, good. All right, and that may be another way to think about yep. um, grouping people. So we'll send out a little post follow up survey. Thank you for attending, and thank you, Mitch. Yep, yep. If anyone has questions, time, send me an email.